Hello, welcome to our latest recycling update. I'm Patrick Cody with Okimo Valley TV, and I'm joined in the studio today again by Ham Gillett, who is the outreach coordinator um, and resident regional recycling guru uh, <laughs> for, uh, well, he's the outreach coordinator for the Southern Windsor and Wyndham Counties Solid Waste Management District, Got as it. well as the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste so, Management District. And you so got welcome, it. Ham. Thank welcome you. Back. Thank you. It seems like you're here on an annual or semi-annual basis. Yes, I am. Recycling update. So maybe your your uh, audience turns the, turns the TV off as soon as I, oh that recycling that guy, guy again. Oh boy. Anything mm -hmm. and everything to do about recycling locally, he is the guy. Um, we are gonna try a, um, to expand on this series by inviting um, viewer questions and comments and complaints and input uh, ahead of time, and then we can read those um, when yeah. we record. Um, so Ham, first, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Tell us, uh, remind us again, the districts that you cover. It's a huge swath of the state. Okay, right? so mainly I'm here today because I cover, uh, I cover the Southern Windsor Windham County Soil Waste Management District, which is 14 towns running from Windsor South to Rockingham over as far west as Plymouth and Baltimore, Athens, Andover, all Springfield. Um, and then I also, uh, wearing a different hat, but doing basically the same job, um, I cover the Greater Upper Valley Cell Waste Management District, which is 10 towns running from Heartland up to Versher and West Fairley, and as far west as Bridgewater. Uh, and that's, what I do is I go into schools, I go, I, I'm on programs like this, um, I talk to rotary clubs, I do drop-ins with businesses and saying, hey, do you know that uh, this is what you're gonna need to do by blah, 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 such and such mm -hmm. a date? Uh, and which is a good segue into uh, one of the main reasons I'm here today and it's my, my campaign for the next six months uh, is to tell people, remind people, that the last piece of the Vermont Recycling Universal Recycling Law Act 148 is going to take place on July 1st, 2020, and that is when everybody in the state of Vermont is going to be required by law to keep their food scraps out of their trash. If you've heard anybody talk about this before, you know that the, basically the reason is that we have one landfill left. It's in, up in, way up in Coventry, which is almost in Canada. Uh, once that landfill is full, Vermont doesn't have any landfills. We're trying to keep the uh, lifespan, extend the lifespan of that one, one landfill. And food scraps uh, make up a large percentage of uh, everybody's daily trash that they throw away, unless you already compost, which is great. Um, I was gonna ask you about that. So in your <clears throat> travels as outreach coordinator yeah. for the Solid Waste District, and you're probably out there talking to different folks, uh, about what's the proportion, your estimate, ballpark, of people that actually compost already? That's a really good question because uh, that there have been studies and surveys done, and the I believe the current Recycling rate in Vermont is, uh, and if somebody's going to be watching this who knows this better than I, but I think it is about, it's around 30%, which is pretty good. Um, and that includes backyard composting, mm -hmm. that includes uh, feeding it to your chickens or pigs or uh, having it picked up and or dropping it off somewhere. So <clears throat> I just wanna quickly go through the options. So July 1st is the deadline. Uh, everybody's gotta do it. Already the big, the big generators are doing it, the major restaurants, the correctional facilities, the universities, most schools I work with are already um, sorting food scraps. So the options for uh, you as a resident um, are as follows, one, um, if you live in a single family dwelling, you can start a backyard composting um, operation. They're very easy, they're very simple. We give, um, during the warmer months, we give composting workshops, uh, backyard composting workshops, and sort of tell people the very basics about how to get started. 
Um, if you have chickens, maybe you're already feeding your food scraps to the chickens. Um, you can also do that with pigs. The Vermont Ag Agency is very, um, is very concerned about feeding meat scraps to swine. And basically, you are not allowed to feed meat scraps to pigs uh, unless only you and your family are consuming that meat. Um, and <clears throat> so that's one option. Um, as of July 1st, every commercial hauler in the state is going to be required to offer service, um, depending on where you live. And they will either yeah, provide the service themselves like or, pick -up service. or they will subcontract mm -hmm. with a company that just picks up food scraps. If you are lucky enough to live in a sort of a uh, more heavily populated area, there probably will be curbside pickup. Um, another option is to take your food scraps to your local transfer station. Uh, they are also required to accept your food scraps. In fact, they are required to do that now. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them will charge you a fee for that. Um, the other option, uh, so that's basically the, that, those are basically the three options. You do it in your backyard, you take it to a transfer station, or you have somebody come and pick it up, or you feed it to your, your, uh, your chickens. Mm. Um, and that's everybody. If you live in an apartment, um, I would suggest that you contact your landlord and say, hey, uh, what are your plans? for this and uh, when, when are we going to start and what do I do? Um, <clears throat> so that, that's the big one. That's the one that... that that's uh, a big change. And this is Act 148, which is the universal recycling law. Started yeah. about a few years ago and was ramping up to this. 2014. This is, this is the big... This yeah, is so five this years. Is, this, yeah, this is the, the, the final piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the most difficult piece because a lot of people uh, just don't want to deal with food scraps other than throwing them in their trash. Um, and I will, will say that there's not going to be anybody out driving around in a police car um, checking on you. Uh, they will do that for restaurants and schools and larger, the larger generators. But um, it's really we are hoping that people will realize the big picture, realize why we're asking you to do it, and also um, to com just to comply because it's, it's the law. The other piece of that that I wanted to mention is that um, you hear, you're hearing more and more about soil health and um, composting your food scraps is a great way to sort of return it back to the earth and to the soil and regenerate the soil rather than having it go in a landfill where I told you before. Uh, Off camera, we were talking about <clears throat> this. Yeah. Somebody did an experiment and pulled carrots out of a landfill. The carrots had been there for like 10 or 15 years, and uh, they looked pretty much like they did on the s store shelf. Um, they, they do not decompose in, in the landfill very fast. So and That's because there's just not enough air. There's not enough air. It's, mm. it's anaerobic as mm. opposed to aerobic, um, and so... Don't throw anything in the landfill. That so you stuff think just doesn't break, break down in the yeah, landfill. Yeah, it doesn't. You're burying it for 500 years. And right? our conversation really started about the, with compostable utensils and cups and this kind of thing. Thank you. We talked about yeah. that. And that's, uh, that's another thing that was on my list of things to just to bring up um, ever so briefly is that um, a, a lot of companies are, are manufacturing compostable uh, cups and bowls and utensils. And... That's a, uh, it's a, it's a, a, an issue because uh, if you go to a restaurant, say a takeout restaurant, and um, you get a Diet Coke in a compostable cup, plastic cup. Typically made from corn. Yes. If that cup does not go to a, into a container that's going to go to a commercial composting facility, then that cup is not going to get composted. Uh, if you throw it in with your plastic recycling, it contaminates the recycling because it's not plastic. And um, so the really, unless, unless that cup that you take out of that restaurant, uh, you can be sure that it's gonna go 
uh, into a container that's going to go to a commercial composting facility where the temperatures get high enough to break down that compostable cup, uh, you might as well throw it in the trash. Uh, and then it doesn't break down. And then it doesn't, which, and then it doesn't break down. That was the conversation. Um, so that, that to me was some new information. You were telling me that, yeah, you can't recycle them. And I was like, well, at least if you throw them in the trash, it'll all eventually break down. So no, that's not the case. Because if it's going to a landfill, which here it is, it's going up to Coventry, yeah. um, it will never, ever, ever break down. Yeah. So what's the point of these compostable containers? Well, uh, they are, uh, it, when, when they work properly, uh, it, 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 it's not plastic. So it has the potential to break down and become soil again. But if you'll notice on a lot of um, compostable uh, packaging or cups that you read, if you read the package, it will say in very f fine print, uh, this container is only compostable in an industrial composting mm -hmm. facility. And it's very small. No so one's reading that. No, nobody's reading that. So, um, and I wanted to say one other thing about, um, about this, and that is uh, what something called wish cycling, which I think I may have mentioned before. But um, ever since China two years ago said to the United States, we don't want any more of your plastic, um, it's been bottlenecked and backed up. And some of you may have been told by your hauler that um, they're no longer taking certain kinds of plastic. That's because... Um, China, all other Southeastern, uh, Southeast Asian countries don't want our contaminated plastic anymore. So we're stuck with it. So wish cycling is when you take, um, uh, usually it happens with plastic. You take something plastic and you say, oh gosh, this doesn't have a, one of those recycling symbols on it, but it's plastic. So I'm going to throw it into my single stream recycling. Uh, you've just contaminated your whole bunch of recycling because you've put something in there that doesn't recycle. So uh, we are asking that uh, when in doubt, you throw it out. Um, if you get something from a hardware store that, uh, like a tape measure, and it comes in shrink wrapped or that bubble plastic, that is not recyclable. Mm -hmm. So throw it in the trash. And plastic um, bags and. Um... Plastic bags film shopping bags, mm -hmm. take them back to your grocery store. And I just learned the little paper receipts that you get from the grocery store, hardware store, restaurant, so forth, um, are not recyclable because of the thermal printers that they use contain BPAs. Yeah. And they're not recyclable. But how many of us, including myself, have been recycling, thinking that we've been recycling yep. these paper receipts for years? Yeah, I do it too. So there's, it's, I gotta admit, it's a little confusing. It's confusing and it's everywhere. I mm -hmm. mean, we're, 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 you're sort of bombarded with all the things that you So it's safer should... to throw it out, even though we've been talk yes. keep talking about yes. the need to recycle. Before we shift gears, I know we need to talk about reducing yes, sir. Um, as well. Uh, there is, we, as an experiment, we did try, uh, we posted right before we went on the set here today, and we're recording this on January, uh, what's today, 8th. Uh, 2020, and uh, we had this idea about you know future shows. We want to reach out and solicit questions from community members and so forth about anything in, to do with recycling. Um, we did if post you, this on our Facebook page right before we went on the set, and we did get you, we got somebody. We got somebody. So thank you to Sharon Godfrey who asked, uh, and we sort of covered this, but <clears> she wanted to know: Are containers for the food scraps being provided, and who will be picking them up? <clears throat> oh. Good question. So for compost. Uh, that depends on where you live and who your uh, who your your current commercial hauler is. Um, oftentimes, the hauler will provide you with a container, and uh, that is something that you have to, to work out with them. Sometimes, um, usually, if you're if you're going to get your your food scraps picked up from your house, your hauler will will want you to use a certain container. Um, if you're doing backyard composting, there are a myriad number of, um, of backyard composters you could use. We at our district um, recommend a soil saver, which is made by uh, Bush Systems in, uh, in Canada. Um, 
other, uh, again, depending on your hauler, sometimes your hauler is going to want you to put your food scraps in a biodegradable plastic bag. Uh, and that all depends. It's very, it just depends on where you live and who's picking your stuff up. That's Great. So thanks, Sharon. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> in, in the future, we'll be sure to uh, get these uh, solicitations out uh, before, right be before, uh, you know, uh, at least more in advance than we did today. Yeah. When in doubt, throw it out. That was the mantra. Um, that was the take home from, um, we're talking about uh, the plastics and the wish cycling and paper yeah. receipts and, and so forth. Plastics. Big, big topic today, and explain a little bit about what, again, just as a reminder for folks, what plastics you can recycle, what you can't, and what do we do about this proliferation of plastics in our lives? Oh, boy. Well, that's a topic unto itself <laughs> for another show. But I will say uh, that the Vermont Universal Recycling Law, <clears throat> excuse me, um, only requires Vermonters to recycle plastics one and two. And pretty much those are the two plastics that are, at this point, there is some small market for them in the, in the recycling processes, process industry. <clears throat> Usually just on the bottom of the container or the packaging. It's got the chasing, it's, it's got the chasing yeah. so arrow. one and two. And I heard water. fives are also recyclable. <clears throat> Again, the market is, is so weak right now mm -hmm. that it's hard to uh, it's hard to say, and I don't so want to can't count on it. Yeah, I don't want to say yes, absolutely. Again, depending on where you live in the state, who your hauler is, uh, some haulers will take three through sevens. Um, I know several haulers that have stopped taking three through seven because they can't find a market. For There's them. no market for them. So, um, and that's that's a lot of plastic. So uh, what happened? I mean, assuming not everybody is cognizant of this or even paying attention. So, I mean, all sorts of plastics numbers, one all the way through through up to, I guess it goes up to seven? Seven, yeah. yeah. So one through seven are ending up at a recycling facility. What are they doing with all that? Is it contaminating the lot or do they actually go in and pull them out? That well, ones that yeah, what happens is, it, is that um, your hauler will take your uh, all of the recycling from his route and they will take it to, one of the places they take it is to the Casella MRF over in West Rutland, which is stands for Material Recovery Facility. And there's several of them throughout. And there's the, there are several of them. In Vermont. And how, how, uh, it, it, I think there are two in Vermont. Okay. They're huge facilities, uh, and they cost millions of dollars to build. And they're all uh, privatized. And they're all privatized. Uh, so what happens is you're, the truck will dump this great pile of of mixed recyclables, and then they will go uh, right up on this. Uh, conveyor belt, and they get sorted by um, flotation tanks, by blowers, and by human beings. So all of that one, th uh, three through seven plastic will get probably at, th at this point, um, if it's being sorted, it will get pulled out by, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll get pulled out by human beings, and it'll get thrown in the landfill. So Sad to say, but that's what's happening mm -hmm. at the moment. Interesting thing is happening is that uh, even though the Chinese basically said to us, we don't want your plastics, the Chinese are also investing in building plastics processing facilities in this country. So, you know, what goes around of course. comes around. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> okay, so thanks for that. And then... Um, what else we want to touch on uh, the household hazardous waste? Oh, household hazardous waste. Yeah, I know you have a couple collection events. There's, There's going to be a personal anecdote about that. Yes, sir. I have had a bunch of these um, metal uh, spray foam, um, you know, uh, spray foam insulation cans mm -hmm. empty. Uh, I was told on one hand, this is probably a year or two ago, they can go in the metal recycling bin, mm -hmm. um, and then most recently I was told, no, 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 those are those are household hazardous waste and you have I guess only two collection dates a year so I have to hold on to them and bring them then so if it is hazardous uh, I apologize but I have been throwing them up until recently in, in the uh, in the middle bin so I don't know what happens um, they probably yeah and, and again it, you know it, it you you depending on who you're asked you'll get a, a different answer supposedly if they're completely empty they are, yeah, they, they are they are recyclable. Maybe, but maybe the feeling the, the theory is that there's always going to be some residual, some resi yeah, exactly. And, and it's and it's liquid. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it once once that foam has hardened, 
it's really not toxic, mm -hmm. but if it's liquid, then it could, mm -hmm. you know, leach into something. So, so that was just a segue. I personally ended up to segue into these yeah. household hazardous <clears throat> waste dates. I know you have, is it one or two per year at we each are of the transfer stations? Yeah, we are required by the state in 2020 to have only two. We've mm -hmm. have in the past been required to have four. Mm -hmm. So there will be one uh, at some point in the spring, May or June, in this solid waste district, and then there will probably be one in the fall. Mm -hmm. They have not been scheduled yet. Um, last year, 2019, uh, for some reason, there you know I'm sure there, there are plenty of reasons. The cost of running one of these um, events skyrocketed, and we are now paying. Uh, I think we paid twenty three thousand dollars to run a four-hour event uh, this fall and so every time you go into a store a hardware store and decide that you want to buy some foam insulation which you need to do or some uh, you know raid wasp spray or you want to put some roundup on your poison ivy or uh, any pesticides herbicides insecticides um, those are all hazardous waste, and they cost a lot of money to dispose of. Mm -hmm. My personal plug is um, another reason to compost. Put your compost on your lawn instead of uh, some herbicides. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, I always people, think of the disposal when you're purchasing a product. Yeah, yeah. People's eyes bug out when I tell them that that cost. I mean, it, it's shocking to them. But it's the it's the labor. Uh, it's the setup fee for the, for the event, it's the breakdown fee, it's the travel cost, but primarily it's the disposal. It's, it's exorbitantly expensive to dispose properly of all these things that we can buy in any number of stores. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, without getting too deeply into the weeds, what, 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 what happens to all those, especially the liquids, when you, once you collect them? Like, how are they dealt with? They're dealt with uh, in different ways. We used a new company this year um, that's based in um, Indiana and Albany, New York. And um, it took us the longest time to get an, an invoice for them because the, all of the stuff they collected, some of it went to a facility in Arkansas, some of it went to Indiana, some of it went somewhere else. And um, depending on what it is, um, a lot of it gets, I think a lot of it gets incinerated. I think probably some of it is, is buried somewhere in some, you know, toxic facility. But it's just, uh, it's everywhere. Mm. And um, so that's what happens. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if, if there was just a giant tank somewhere and just it all went in there. Like but, a nuclear or, re waste repository. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, it goes a, different places. It was, you know, uh, hosed into a side of a mountain or something like that. <laughs> well, and uh, paint is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, Vermont has a pro program called Paint Care. Mm -hmm. uh, so all oh, of recycle your... Recycle paint. Yeah, all yeah. of your paint uh, you can either bring to a hazardous waste collection or you can take it to a participating hardware store any time of year. Um, and a lot of that gets, uh, gets reused, which is terrific. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a good segue into, yeah, talking about paint and, um, and, and the proper disposal and uh, other household items like batteries and light bulbs, and et cetera. Can you tell me? Oh, that? yes. I thought you were going to something else, so I was prepared. I thought you were going into uh, construction waste, but let's, no, let's stop oh, for a moment. Are you no, reading no. my note? No, these, no, notes, no, these no, notes actually yeah. came from We're reading, so yeah, we're reading, <laughs> we're reading the same. You're notes. reading my notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, very quickly, uh, so paint, we know about paint. Uh, you can take paint to a hardware store or bring it to a hazardous waste collection. Please do not throw it in your trash unless the can is completely empty and completely dry then it can be uh, thrown in scrap mode. Oh, empty or dry? Empty and dry, sorry. So empty. if you have some like residue around the paint can itself? If, if it's a latex paint can yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and the paint is, the, every, the paint, whatever paint is left there is completely hard as a rock, you can throw that in the trash. Or in the metal recycling. If it's got, you know, if you've got that much paint in it yeah. and it's hard as a rock, oh, okay. throw it in the trash. Oh. 
if it's empty, if the can okay. is empty, yeah. and the you know the drippings on the side are completely solidified, yeah. then you could put that in the in the metal. So there's and that goes for oil base as well. Um, batteries, please do not throw your batteries in the trash. Um, your batteries can be recycled at your transfer station, again, at participating hardware stores. Um, in in, um, the, my, in what I call my district, the Greater Upper Valley District, I have a, um, if there's not a transfer station in the town, I have a five gallon kitty litter bucket in front of every town hall office that says batteries, and people can come and drop off their batteries there. So that's, that's alkaline, you know, A, double A, triple A, uh, lithium, whatever. Um, if you can, it's uh, so. What happens is those get emptied into a insulated box, and Mary and I uh, ship those boxes. Mary, uh, Mary O'Brien is my colleague. Who's Gotta give Mary a plug. Mary needs a plug. Mary, recycling manager of this district, Southern uh, Windsor Windham County, and she collects batteries as well. And we we ship them. We either take them to a transfer station or we ship them. Um, if they're lithium or nickel cadmium NICAD, mm -hmm. uh, put them in a plastic bag or put a piece of tape over the terminal. That gets confusing, mm -hmm. but um, basically, uh, just put them in a bag and get them to one of our boxes or to a transfer station. Uh, they're nasty. They're full of nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. Should not go in the landfill. Um, Electronics. I think everybody should know by now that e that uh, electronics e-waste. There's also a program called Vermont E-Cycles. Uh, computers, monitors, mice, cables, desktop printers, basically computers and any computer peripheral, and television sets are recyclable for free at any participating transfer station in the state of Vermont. I want to give the Ludlow Transfer Station a shout out for uh, for their help with that. Last oh, year, uh, a couple years ago, we were getting rid of a lot of our old analog. Yep. Um, yeah, we had monitors, TV sets, um, VCRs, yep. and DVD players, and some. a lot of them were in various states of disrepair that had no value anymore. And so so um, just just uh, to be sure that people understand that usually VCRs and, and DVD players uh, are not computer related. So they are not, if you take one to a transfer station, you may get charged a couple of bucks for that. Some transfer stations charge for the non-covered, some don't. But if you take a, a, your old stereo system, a toaster, a microwave, those are considered non-covered electronics. You'll, you will pay for those. One more. Light bulbs. Light bulbs. Fluorescent bulbs. Uh, again, please don't put them in the trash. The curly QCFL bulbs. Mercury. They got mercury in them and uh, nasty stuff. What about incande old incandescent ones? Incandescents can go in the trash. There's nothing nasty about them. Oh. They can't be recycled. So, um, oh. and, and, uh, and the new LED ones? The new LED ones, um, they, that's... You shouldn't need to get rid of them too often because they right. last forever. But right. uh, when you do, in this, what do you do with them? This particular program, uh, the company that we use uh, in the state of Vermont, most that a lot of us use for uh, for recycling, uh, LEDs are um, are not collectible. I would say LEDs are coming everywhere. Um, ask your local hardware store. Mm -hmm. Ask your transfer station if they take them or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what else? We did want to talk, or you wanted to talk about uh, construction and demolition changes, waste mm -hmm. changes, because I know that some of the transfer stations are no longer accepting um, construction waste. Care the, to explain? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, I'd be happy to. That did that did occur. And this is problematic for a lot of uh, contractors and homeowners alike. Right. This this happened uh, with two particular transfer stations. Uh, very close by to each other in the Upper Valley this summer. And uh, it was a major problem because um, they both stopped taking construction debris at the same time, you know, high to the building season. Um, one of them has since started up again. Uh, the other one is not doing it yet. But um, 
it's a big issue because when you are on a job site and you're filling a 30 yard container with um, you know demolition construction debris um, you want to have a place to take it and uh, some construction sites uh, where I've been on they they tend to uh, you know it's a container if you th finish your lunch you throw your trash in the container and that's um, a really the big open dumpsters yeah the big roll off container yeah. if you know if if a if a facility is accepting construction debris they want construction debris they don't want styrofoam cups and plastic utensils and aluminum Turkey sandwiches. cans yeah, and, you know half half eaten sandwiches they want just your construction debris so um, uh, that yes that was a that was a that was a, a blip uh, there are other facilities that sort of stepped in and said well we'll take your your stuff this summer, but um, it, it's a problem when you've been, it's kind of like plastics. If you've been, you know, if you're used to throwing all your plastics in a container and they go away, they get recycled somewhere and suddenly somebody says, oh no, we're not taking that anymore. Uh, what do you do? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you had told what? me about a company in, uh, uh, in Brattleboro. Well, well, I had asked you if you if if, I, if the solid waste district had any official stance on or uh, if you guys did any work to promote um, deconstruction versus demolition, because I know that you know creating less waste w is maybe part of solving that problem that you speak of. Or I, I will waste. say, in all honesty, that we at least I don't in my solid waste district. I don't I don't do enough. Mm -hmm. Promoting of that, um, I do let try to let builders know that there are places uh, like Cover Home Repair right. in White River Junction uh, for we'll salvage take, building materials. Salvage will take some, right. but um, it, we are familiar with this um, company, Deconstruction Works, mm -hmm. um, that was uh, that does demolition work. I mean, takes it, apart buildings and or parts of buildings or anything in between, nail by nail, board by board. Um, and they were here doing a project uh, late this fall, I think back in November, and we went out and on location and, mm -hmm. and interviewed the owner of that company about what he does and um, what the value is in deconstruction versus demolition. I watched that uh, video. That was uh, yeah. pretty amazing. It's, a, it's very, very time-consuming, but they're very committed to what they do, and they've done everything from residential entire residential homes to um like big big buildings mm -hmm. um and it's great because they've got all of this material there's nothing wrong with it and uh it can be reused in another building so so to your knowledge is are there any other organizations like deconstruction works i think they're out as like the pioneer valley and Western Mass, Brattleboro area, mm -hmm. but are there any others doing that kind of work? Uh, I know of one up in the up in Chittenden County in the Burlington area, and the the, the name is escaping. Well, it used me. to be Recycle North, but now it's Resource. Great, right, thank you. Yep, Resource. Uh, yeah, and and they were really the model. They're really the leaders, at least in yep. the, in New England, um, with with um, building deconstruction, and yeah. so they sort of mentored these other. Um, organizations that have sprung up since, like Deconstruction Works, and I think maybe um, uh, oh, the Habitat for Humanity, I know there isn't one around here, but they have, they do some similar work. Okay, I didn't, uh, I didn't know that. And Cover, I think. Cover, did, did, cover. I don't know if they still do it, but I think for a while they were doing. Some. It took, they're 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 selective about what they'll about what they'll take. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of a lot of things they will take uh, and resell them in their store. Uh, I think smaller amounts they will take to actually do uh, a repair job on a on a home, mm -hmm. um, but they do take some. I'm just checking to see if we got any. No, we did not get anybody else. Next time we'll have to get that out a little bit more in advance. But I want to thank uh, Sharon Godfrey for at least chiming in with with her one question. Yes. So. Um, well, Ham. Uh, that about wrap it up? That about wraps it up. At least I will. for this time. Yeah. Oh, I'll be back yeah, good. if you invite me. Yeah. Uh, two, one, two things. One of the things I mentioned to you in that, that article that I read uh, in the New York Times mm -hmm. um, about where our plastics are going and are they actually getting recycled, um, there was a quote that said, shop, shop like nothing is recyclable. In other words, whenever you have a chance to uh, buy in bulk 
or buy something that's not in a package, do it. That's one less thing that you have to stop scratch. wish cycling. That's stop something you stop wish cycling. That's something you mentioned earlier. And the one yeah. that I always say, and I'm sure I said it before on this program, is when you throw something away, where is away? Mm -hmm. When you throw something in your trash, where is it going? Mm -hmm. It's not just simply it's, going away. It's not just going. It's not out of sight, out of mind. It's going to mm -hmm. end up somewhere. Good. And if people have more questions or um, you know want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, you can call me at uh, my office, which is 674-4474, offices in Escutney, or you can call Mary O'Brien at 674-9235. Mm -hmm. And we'll uh, put your email addresses and up you on the screen put your as emails well. and mm -hmm. our website addresses mm -hmm. on the screen. Great. Well, Ham, I want to thank you for taking the time oh, out today. Oh, my pleasure. And uh, we'll pleasure. do this again, and hopefully we'll have more questions from... Uh, from viewers. Okay, All right. excellent. And thank you to Ham for answering those questions in the studio today, uh, giving us a recycling update as we gear up for the final implementation of uh, Act 148, the uh, universal recycling law uh, that has to do with composting that goes into effect uh, this coming July. Uh, as we mentioned during the show, we took, uh, we, we solicited some questions from viewers like you and uh, those came in via our Facebook page. Um, we only had time to address one of those questions during the recording of the show. Many other questions actually came in after the recording. So what we're going to do is take a ride down to Escutney to the Southern Windsor County Regional Planning Commission office where uh, Ham works um, on behalf of the Solid Waste District and pose those questions to him. So come along. So this question came in from the Cavendish Facebook uh, page. Um, my condo complex does not even offer recycling. What would you tell this person? Aha. Well, I'd go to the landlord and say, uh, if you're offering trash, you, it would be really great if you could offer recycling too. It may be that the landlord um, understands that there's recycling at the local transfer station and therefore he or she does not have to provide it. But from a tenant standpoint, if you are going out to the parking lot of the complex to empty your trash, you want to be able to get rid of your recycling too. And if you can't, you might be uh, inclined to throw your recycling in the trash, which is not great. And, you know, bottom line, it's, it's uh, against the law. So I would say talk to your landlord and see what, what the issue is. So this also came from the Cavendish Facebook page. Other than opening a museum, what can I do with my lovely collection of styrofoam coolers? <laughs> Uh, don't, first of all, don't buy any more. Uh, second of all, styrofoam is a big issue. Styrofoam, uh, a lot of people will notice there's a chasing, recycling chasing arrow on it, and it's, I think it says number six. Uh, that's white, that's uh, greenwashing. Uh, styrofoam is not recycle, recyclable anywhere in this area. The only places you can recycle styrofoam tend to be outside of major metropolitan areas where a huge volume of it is being uh, generated. And then they have uh, facilities that will, you know, squish it and make it into more styrofoam. So I'd say avoid styrofoam wherever you can. Uh, if you've got these coolers, um, you might post it on Listserv or Facebook saying, hey, I've got all these great coolers. Does anybody need them? Uh, you'd be surprised what people come up with. And um, one other suggestion I have is if you're a gardener and you're making a, uh, filling a window box or a planter, and you've got, uh, if it's this big and you don't want to waste all that soil, uh, fill the bottom half with broken up pieces of styrofoam and then put a piece of uh, hard, uh, not hardware cloth, but landscaping cloth or uh, newspapers over it to hold the dirt and fill the rest of it up with dirt, put your plants in the top. It's great, it makes great drainage, and it's a lot lighter to carry around. That's a good suggestion. Okay, um, how about this one? What happens to meat and bone scraps? <laughs> ah, okay. If you are composting at home, you cannot put your meat and bone scraps in the trash. Uh, your compost pile will not get hot enough because it's not big enough to kill all the pathogens. So the best thing is uh, you have two options. One is to continue to throw them in the trash, which you are allowed to do as of July 1st when the no food scraps 
go into effect. Uh, you could also, if you want, take your meat scraps and bones to a local transfer station. They are required to collect food scraps and their food scraps will end up in a big commercial composting facility where the windrows are giant and you'll see steam come on, coming off them and that they will get hot enough to kill all the pathogens. Are containers for the food scraps being provided? And if so, who will be picking them up? If you live in a, if you live in a single family dwelling and you, um, you have curbside pickup for your trash and recycling, uh, talk to your hauler. They may or may not want to pick up from you. Uh, the, the legislature is still trying to figure out the nitty gritty of this law. But as it turns out, I think if you live in a rural area on a, on a dirt road, haulers are not going to be required to come to your house and pick it up. It's not economically feasible for them. Uh, you know, if Mrs. Jones has a three gallon bucket of lettuce and she lives a mile up a dirt road, uh, it's, it's not economical and the carbon footprint is big for a, to run a truck and pick that up. So <clears throat> if you live in a rural area, chances are if you don't compost yourself in your yard, in your backyard, uh, your option, your other, really your other option is to take your food scraps to a local transfer station and drop them off. Uh, depending on the transfer station, they may or may not charge you for that, and uh, it would be good to ask before you show up with your food scraps. Oh, if you're a restaurant, um, talk to your hauler. Again, most restaurants now should be sorting food scraps because they're generating a certain volume per year or per month. Um, the one thing to remember is that no meat or bones should be fed to pigs. Uh, even if, uh, if you've been you know, putting together a ham sandwich and your lettuce touches your piece of ham or chicken or whatever, uh, that should not be fed to pigs. There are all sorts of rules set up by the ag uh, agency if you want to go on, online. And we can put that, web, that um, link on the website. Um, anyway, so no, no meat scraps to pigs. A lot of people um, have chickens or a lot of people's neighbors have chickens. Uh, I know of some schools where their food scraps go to chickens, uh, not to pigs. How can we reduce paper recycling and junk mail? We're paying to get rid of recyclable paper. Is it actually being recycled? And so much household paper waste seems to be junk mail. Number one, I'm quite sure that paper is still being recycled. Uh, so that's a good thing. It also, if you have a compost bin at home, paper makes a great uh, carbon material to offset the nitrogen, which is your food scraps. Uh, so that's one thing to think about. Um, if I would say to get, you know, get less junk mail, um, I have gotten myself off all mailing lists pretty much by um, when I get a catalog or a magazine I don't want, you can find in the fine print uh, a, either a, a number to call or uh, an email to say, please take me off your mailing list. But the, the key thing, when you ask a particular company to take you off their mailing list, you also have to ask them not to make your information available to anybody else because they're constantly selling your information to other companies and that just spreads and spreads and spreads. So not only say, please take me off your mailing list, also say, please do not make my information available to anybody else. Um, ne next question um, is, uh, what does this look like for a restaurant owner? Who takes care of the scraps and who enforces it? Uh, enforcement, I'm going to start with that because a lot of people are asking about that. Uh, the state will be enforcing larger generators like schools, restaurants, uh, universities, correctional facilities, that sort of thing. They're probably not going to go after uh, Mrs. Jones and her small bag of trash. 
But uh, we're hoping that for the most part, people will understand the bigger picture and why the state is asking us to keep our food scraps out of, the, out of our trash because we're, our landfill is filling up and we have no other landfill after that's done. Uh, also, very quickly, uh, food scraps turned into compost can regenerate the soil. And so it's a cyclical thing. Um, restaurants, talk to your hauler. Uh, your hauler is required to offer you, provide you, or offer you food scrap pickup. Uh, if they cannot do it themselves, then they should be providing you with the name of another company or hauler who will pick it up, pick your food scraps up. Um, and also, depending on the hauler, some haulers will provide you a food scrap container uh, sometimes they will ask you to rent it or they'll sell it to you, but that's, that's really individually um, to the hauler. I know of one um, woman in Ludlow who I spoke to recently who um, runs a catering company and she, God bless her, she takes all of her food scraps um, to the Ludlow transfer station. And um, so that's another option. If the information that there are no actual destinations for much of our recycled goods is true, what actions do you recommend we pressure for to make recycling useful again? Also, do you think pressuring producers to use less packaging is helpful to reduce the amount of junk, in theory recyclable, uh, material that we collect? Number one, yes, it's great to pressure uh, producers of all this packaging um, to, to stop. And you know you can stop buying their product, but that's not going to really make a dent. Um, the state, uh, so a lot of my colleagues in the state are, are working, and in Montpelier are working on this thing called producer responsibility, which is already happening with paint and batteries and electronics and uh, fluorescent light bulbs. There are state programs where you can, all that stuff is no longer supposed to go in the landfill, and there are companies that are. Uh, we're sending it all back to. Um, yes, pressure the companies. Um, I had a friend who's no longer living, uh, lived down in Arlington, and she used to, when she went to the grocery store, she would unpack all of her uh, packaging and leave it at the checkout counter and say, you deal with it, I don't want it. I'm sure that they hated to see her come, but uh, she was kind of rabid about it. Um, the other thing I would suggest is whenever possible, if you are able economically or, or whatever, in a, what other way, um, buy in bulk, uh, go to co-ops. I mean, a lot of people I know cannot, cannot do this because it tends to be a little bit more expensive, but um, if you can re, you know, buy stuff bulk and bring your containers and fill them up, uh, it's really, it really makes a big difference. I, um, I live by myself, but I have, um, I generate about one 30 gallon trash bag every um, three months. And again, it's partly because I, I, buy, I buy in bulk. Pressure the producers. Yeah. Great idea. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, which has just come up on, on uh, recently, there's been a lot of discussions about <clears throat> Different towns and, and solid waste districts are uh, a, a amassing, for lack of a better word, um, tableware that you can rent or borrow. So um, I, I know of two women whose both of their kids got married the same summer. They went to all yard sales and flea markets and thrift stores and they bought um, unmatched some uh, plates knives, forks, spoons. And when they were done with the two weddings, they built a shed, they put all this material in a shed, and now it's available to anybody who wants to use it. It's free. So um, we are about to start one in, in this solid waste district, I think. Um, and I've been talking to the people at the Central Vermont Solid Waste District who have um, tableware for 200, and including linens, and uh, napkins and tablecloths, tumblers, flatware. So if you're interested in doing that, just start on a very small scale. Um, you know, go to the thrift store or go to your own closet, um, put together a box of you know, 12 plates and then 
put it on the internet or a listserv and tell people, hey, if you want to borrow this stuff, um, give me a call. And last but not least, here is the last, uh, here's the final question that came up. Uh, it's more of a um, comment about uh, attracting rats to your compost. How do you deal with meat scraps to uh, keep from attracting rats to your compost bin? Okay, well, we addressed the meat scrap question earlier. Don't put meat scraps in your pile. Um, Kat Buxton, who is uh, uh, my composting guru, she and I do workshops together. She's uh, unbelievably knowledgeable about, about composting and soil and all the rest of it. But her, th her motto is, if you do it well, it doesn't smell. Um, and her theory is that you, when you look in your compost pile, you should never see any food scraps. They should, be, uh, they should be sitting on some straw or sawdust or wood chips or whatever. And every time you go into your pile, um, you know, pull the, the brown stuff, the carbon away, make a little nest, dump your food scraps in, and then cover it up. Because when animals can't smell and can't see food scraps, they're much less likely to come and get into your food scraps. I know a lot of people have problems with bears, and that's a whole other issue. Uh, another th uh, about rats, um, the other thing, if you're building your own composting unit, use quarter inch hardware cloth, put it on the bottom, on the sides, and on the top. Uh, and even if you buy a composter like the soil savers that we sell at this solid waste district, um, they, are, they have no bottom to them. So I suggest that people put a piece of hardware cloth, lay it down. Uh, it's hard to bend on the edges because it's pretty stiff. But if you, um, if you put it down and then put the composter on top of it, you're avoiding critters being able to dig up from underneath. Ham, thank you for uh, taking the time to answer uh, all these viewer questions. You're welcome. Keep them coming. <laughs> That's going to be a wrap for this uh, recycling update with Ham. Uh, I want to thank him for his time and uh, for your questions. And he'll be coming in again uh, in the coming months. And uh, we'll be taking more of your questions. So, uh, so far, this was uh, a, a pilot, uh, a little experiment, and it, and it went well. So um, we'll be doing more of them. And uh, you might remember earlier in the show, we were talking a little bit about construction waste and demolition versus deconstruction, and Ham actually talked about, um, made mention of um, deconstruction works, an outfit out of the Brattleboro area that does building materials reuse and deconstruction work. We actually had an opportunity back in the fall, uh, it was in November, to go on site at one of their jobs uh, here in Ludlow in the village, um, converting a building into um, what's going to be a real estate office and coffee shop that's soon to open. So um, let's, uh, let's check that out right now. My name is Eric Kruger, and I'm one of the owners of Deconstruction Works. We're a business that serves Vermont, dismantling buildings, commercial interiors, barns, with the idea of saving for reuse. I've been in this, these trades for about 15 years, specifically deconstructing, and in the carpentry trades for another 10 years before that. Somebody calls us up because they, uh, they want something taken down, but they don't want to see it destroyed. Maybe it's got some family history. Maybe they're buying a lot next to their house and don't want to see a house there anymore. Um, commercial, oftentimes it's just a remodel or a refit. And we come in and give them a price to do the work and instead of filling dumpsters, we uh, save the material for resale. TPW does property management in a lot of the ski areas and uh, they're fitting out this space. It used to be a board shop, now it's going to become a real estate office and a coffee shop. I think most tradespeople will tell you there's a lot of waste in our industry and uh, it's usually about time and money. So for folks who aren't used to recycling, deconstructing takes more time, costs more money, so it's not on the table. Um, we usually meet with clients early on and say, this is what we can do for you, this is how much time it's gonna take, and at the end, this is how much material you're gonna save, how much money you're gonna save. And you know, it's usually a, a motivated client in terms of ecological reasons or for example, in Chester, when we took down, the, there was an old farmhouse where the gas station is now. That was a director from the town. They wanted to see the building saved. They couldn't save it, but deconstruction was the next best choice. So most of our work is done with uh, pry bars and sawzalls. 
and we're trying to take things out as close to the way they were put in as possible. So our studs might be three inches shorter, but we do pull all the nails in our studs and then we offer them for sale. Plywood, nails get pulled, or I should say shot out with a pneumatic tool, and uh, they're offered for sale as plywood. I've just come back from a national conference of building reuse folks, and uh, there's a very obvious face of reuse with the habitat restores. Those tend to be sort of product overstock, but there's a, a sort of parallel um, industry of people who are actually dismantling things. And if you think about it, you know, the Amish have been doing it for, for decades, and many of the barns we've taken apart have timbers in them that have been reused two or three times. Same with bricks. So this has always been an, an economic reality for some people, but as a viable business concern, it's been probably the last 25 years that businesses are, are focused on this. We're pretty much the only business doing this in Vermont. Recycle North, now Resource, used to have a deconstruction crew. There was a fellow down in Mass doing it for a while. He's working for us now. So we, it's really a question of capacity, you know, willing customers and enough of us to go and do it. Well, when you're taking something apart, there's a lot of energy still in it. Sometimes there's a lot of history in it. Um, sometimes the materials are of higher quality than you can find now. Uh, we were working in Manchester at the uh, what's going to become the TJ Maxx, and they had a cinema in there, that, a partition wall down the middle of the cinema with 26-foot 2x4s. And those were practically clear. There was no knots in them. So maybe you're just building a shed, but wouldn't you rather build a shed with lumber that doesn't have knots in it, that's still straight and true? And folks that want to do that, we're a source for them. When we're working for a private party um, that can take advantage of a charitable donation, we'll often donate the materials on their behalf to a charity so they um, they receive a charitable donation value for the for the materials from the entire project so that can be anywhere from fifty thousand dollars up to a hundred thousand dollars it all depends on how much how the building's built and how we take it down and that sort of an offset to the deconstruction cost so we're cost competitive with demo when schedule is not the issue This has been an Okemo Valley TV presentation.